Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. Well, everybody, uh, get out your party hats and balloons and noisemakers, because this is episode number 600 of the Narrative Lectionary Podcast uh, at, at Working Preacher. But I will, say, I will note that uh, prior to coming over to Working Preacher, we did have a year or two at the Narrative Lectionary, <laughs> so that this is podcast number 600, but it's been going, it, I mean, you know, for 14, 15 years now. So that's really a reason to celebrate. And what a fun text to do it with. Um, we're starting off um, Advent, and most places might have their own Advent theme. But we're going to be um, starting, uh, you know, we start Advent here uh, in the exile with the story of Daniel. And then we're going to end up, of course, by the end of Advent in our gospel for the year in the New Testament. This is the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, Daniel chapter six, uh, a, a dorky thing about this and then a funny thing and then we'll get going. The dorky thing is, hey, for those of you in your Old Testament program, Catherine, who had to take a semester of Aramaic, this is one of the few chances that you get to use it. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the part of the book of Daniel, um, there's a couple parts of the Old Testament, parts of Ezra and parts of Daniel that are written in Aramaic, which is related to Hebrew. And if you had to th- learn it, celebrate, because this now you get to use it, right? Isn't that fun? That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. For for, uh, for Bible geeks everywhere. (laughs) uh, A funny, funny part of it was one of my, uh, one of my professors and heroes, uh, Roy Harrisville, when he was in seminary working uh, with a local church for, uh, at the start of um, Sunday school, back in the days when they had a Sunday school opening for a while, he was telling Bible stories and uh, he got a complaint uh, from some parents because when he told the story of Daniel's in the lion's den, at least one little boy, one little boy soiled his pants. Oh. Roy was so frightening oh with his, his portrayal of the lions. Oh and so I, wow. I think that's great. So just wow. you know, tone down your telling of the story this week, maybe. Or else yeah. maybe don't. Or, or else maybe don't. don't. Yeah. Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so That's really yeah. funny. That's really funny. Wow. Wow. Oh. There were lions, and, by the way. There were lions in Mesopotamia and into Israel. The last one, I think, was killed about a century ago in the wild. Um, but if people go, hey, are there lions? Were there? Yes, there once were lions. Yeah. And they were kept by kings to hunt, right? There are some, uh, there are some think- uh, famous Assyrian inscriptions showing the royal lion hunt. Uh, yeah. Know, so, the, so the kings hunted on horseback, shot arrows at the lions to kill them. I didn't know that they were kept to hunt, but I know that it was, the king was the shepherd of the people, and part of being the shepherd of the people, as you get from the story of David, is killing the lion. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. a part of royal propaganda, as it were, is to, is, is to show the king killing the lion as a way of sort of demonstrating the kings. But I didn't realize that. That's a, that's, uh, I didn't realize yeah, they I, were actually kept for that purpose. That's cool. I'm, pr- I mean, I'm, not for I'm the lion. pretty sure about that. They were, yeah, not, not cool for the lion. That actually, no. <laughs> uh, the, year I, the, the year I lived in, in Ethiopia and taught uh, at the Lutheran seminary there in Addis Ababa, we, we toured some, I think they were like 15th century palaces uh, in a, oh. uh, in a town called Gondor, and they they actually kept lions. They showed us where the where the lions were kept for the for the royal wow. hunts as well. So certainly, the lion as a as a pretty potent symbol for um, power and danger. Power. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but yes. Yeah, so the 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 other point, though, I mean, the major point here is that Daniel uh, is faithful uh, to. To the one true God, right? The uh, uh, you all you all know the story, right? Daniel is a Jew uh, in the in the court of King Darius, uh, the Persian king. Um, actually, the book of Daniel kind of goes from Babylonian to Persians, but here the Persian king, uh, 
Uh, and uh, he's well favored by the king, but uh, his his fellow uh, courtiers are jealous of him, so they try to uh, get rid of him. And so they get the king, who seems like a you know a pretty yeah. persuadable guy. Uh, he gets him to issue a decree that no one can pray to anyone except him for thirty days. Daniel refuses to pray to the king and instead continues to pray to the God of Israel three times a day. Uh, and uh, he is uh, against the king's will. Uh, the king has to sentence him to go into the lion's den. So that's the setup for the story. Uh, I think our, our commentator uh, who wrote on this uh, very helpfully talked about the uh, the, the situation of um, – uh, Kristen Swanson uh, wrote on this, talked about the 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 decision that has to be made for the Jews when they're living as a subject people in another land or even in their own land under the control of foreign powers. Uh, you know, how much do you assimilate? How much do you uh, how much do you kind of stand on principle? That's a that's an ongoing question uh, mm-hmm. for the Jews through throughout history, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, And here, you can see that, I mean, Daniel is part of the royal court. He actually does, um, I don't know if assimilate is the right word, but he certainly participates as a citizen in the the Persian Empire. He's a good citizen. Uh, But there's a line that he won't cross, right? The line is faithfulness to, 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 to the God of Israel, to to the one true God, he will not uh, he will not betray that. Uh, he will not become that Persian, right? He's going to yeah. uh, he's going to remain a Jew, uh, even as he's a good citizen of the Persian court. We see this similar stories, of course, in the Book of Esther, um, uh, and and elsewhere in the Book of Daniel, right? How do you and how Joseph. do you remain faithful? And Joseph, yeah, how do you remain faithful? To the faithful God we've been talking about uh, all uh, all year. How do you remain faithful uh, in the face of um, opposition and danger? If I dare, yeah. And if I yeah. dare, in in the company of two uh, First Testament uh, scholars, <laughs> say this is uh, the living out of what it means to be in the world, but not of. The world in the in that that sense. Um, what always strikes me about Daniel um, as uh, a representative of the people of God is um, the respect that he garnered uh, from the king, and the only thing that they could find to um, to that they could find him guilty of was his faithfulness to God. And so they had to create a law that made it um uh th- that made his faithfulness to God illegal. You know, they knew that he would pray. So they had to make praying to anyone other than the king illegal. And the king missed that and as you said, you know, against his own will had to follow the law that was made. And I, I think it's worth noteworthy not to miss that they conspired against Daniel because of that envy, uh, that coveting, um, and in that conspire uh, cons- conspiracy created uh, what made it impossible for him to be faithful. What would have made it impossible for him to be faithful to God. And last week we talked about how God um, does not. Uh, submit to human rebellion. Here, Daniel does not submit to social pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm, um, a, yes to all of that. Thanks. I'm trying to figure out if there's anything uh, specifically theological in any of the language. You know, in verse 13, uh, O King, uh, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah pays no attention to you, uh, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. I'm just uh, the the word um, to pay attention to. I'm just I'm not sure there's anything there 
Um, and, and again, part of this is we are in Aramaic uh, and not um, Hebrew. In Hebrew, so it, it is harder f- uh, for me. But it is uh, it, what it is. What it is noticeable to me, though, is that the um, the three times uh, the three times a day uh, that he uh, that he does this. So it's it's the prayers. It's not that he even just prays once, like secretly in his house at night or something. But this is, I mean, you know, it's um, throughout the day and in such a way that his faithfulness is made known. And I, I, I'm just, I don't know if there's anything here for us, but that do we, do we follow our faith in such a way that it is, um, that we're, we're not calling our attention to ourselves in the sense of that Jesus, you know, Jesus said, hey, listen, don't practice your faith publicly to draw attention to yourself. But on the other hand, are we living lives of faith such that uh, was it Bonhoeffer who said something like, um, uh, "Live your faith in such a way that the atheist questions their non-belief," you know, that sort of thing. I don't know who said it, but uh, it's good. In our in our country, we are not in danger uh, in North America if we practice our faith, and we shouldn't pretend that we are. I mean, we might lose a job or something, right? You know, we might, but we're not going to, uh, for the most part, um, most of us uh, be at risk of being thrown into a lion's den. There are places uh, in the world where Christians are very endangered if they practice their faith publicly. It's, this is a chance to call attention to those places. Yes. Uh, it's also true for Jews, of course, uh, to call into that into attention. But also just to say, um, are we? Uh, this is Advent. As we prepare, maybe it's are we keeping Advent in a way that um, marks us not as just consumers uh, of yes. the last best hope of the economy, but uh, as as um, faithful followers of Jesus. It's worth noting that Daniel, um, from the beginning, is one of the four Hebrew boys that are um, exiled to Babylon, um, who are uh, to be taught the ways of Babylon. And um, in in the opening of the book of Daniel, we learn that uh, uh, their um, willingness to eat only what is acceptable for them to eat as, you know, descendants of Abraham and Sarah becomes um, a threat to their health, at least for those who are overseeing them. And the, in, once again, they're trusting God while in exile, while living in uh, a, a, a community that doesn't follow their practices. And so here you have um, Daniel once again in that same situation, but this time um, because of the jealousy that has been, um, so it's an intentional act. It's a little bit different than it was, uh, with the, with the, with the four of them at the beginning of uh, the story of their ex, uh, exilic experience. Um, and, and one of the things that also draws attention to me, which goes along with what you were saying, Ralph, is that this is a question of seeking worldly power or trusting godly power. Uh, and in all of these acts, Daniel is trusting God. Uh, and so he's living his life in a way where whoever it was that said would cause people to say, hmm, um, I'm not sure if I'm right because what's happening with these followers of God just seems to be so convicting. I Love to Tell the Story is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. The Narrative Lectionary was developed at Luther Seminary and has been hosted on Working Preacher since 2011. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash narrative. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.